uh, this evening it occurs to me to talk about something which is a little bit unusual for me and uh, as a topic of the talk I'd like to talk about Buddhism Now you might think that as a Buddhist monk that that's fairly normal, but actually it's not. Because actually, uh, often I try to, uh, often, certainly for myself, I try to ignore Buddhism as much as I can. And I was speaking with uh, Ajahn Suchito once uh, when he came visited last year. From Chittas, and he'd just been to visit uh, Thailand, and I said, "How did you like Thailand? Your, your time in Thailand?" He said, oh, "I didn't, didn't have such a great time." I said, "Why not?" He said, "Too much, uh, you know, too much, too much Buddhism." <laughs> and I knew exactly what he meant. You know, too much Buddhism and not enough Dhamma. And so. Uh, and of course, this is one of the great uh, tasks which each of us has is to try to somehow um, find the Dhamma inside Buddhism somewhere. It's not always easy. And of course, uh, you know, in the group of people here today, some of us uh, were born in Buddhist cultures and brought up in Buddhist cultures. That's our background. Others were born in. Um, myself brought us up as a Catholic or people were Jewish or different kinds of backgrounds and so we come to, to Buddhism, come to Dhamma from different kinds of angles but in each case we're drawn together for some kind of reason otherwise you wouldn't be here actually of course as we all know a lot of Buddhists are very happy to just go along and do, this, do the uh, ceremonies. If you're a Chinese Buddhist, you like to go along, go chick, 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 and then you get your, your uh, fortune told. Or you go along and to the monks and in Thailand and you say, Bhante, did you have any good dreams lately? That means, do you, can you tell me next week's lottery number? <laughs> and all of those kinds of things. So this is all Buddhism but not very much Dhamma in it. And so one of the things we try to do is we try to somehow sift out the Dhamma. And there are different ways of doing this. Uh, the background that I came from when I first started practicing in Thailand uh, as a monk is from the Ajahn Chah tradition. And uh, <coughs> Ajahn Chah is of course the great exemplar of the forest tradition. And his approach, you know, was really summed up uh, one time and he said, you know, when he, when he practiced, he didn't use a lot of uh, refined theory or uh, study, but he just took the, the basic teachings on the Four Noble Truths and tried to apply them uh, with as much sincerity as possible. And so this is really the hallmark of the forest tradition, okay? hallmark of the forest tradition is not any particular doctrine. What doctrines does the forest tradition teach? Well, they might teach various kinds of doctrines, but that's not really how it's defined. It's not any kind of particular meditation technique. Okay, So in that respect, the Thai tradition is quite different from the Burmese tradition. Burmese tradition is very much defined in terms of what meditation technique you do. The Thai tradition you know, if you go to one of the, the, the forest masters and say, I do Goenka technique, or I do Mahasi technique, or I do Anapana, or I do Metta, or something, then the teacher usually will just say, oh yeah, just, just, um, just be mindful. Stay with the knowing. Yeah. And so they're not... It's not that they don't teach different kinds of meditations. Of course they do, and they'll teach different ones in different contexts. But they're not so much hung up on one particular meditation technique. But their main concern is the attitude and the sincerity which you bring to the practice, not so much the, what the method is that you're using. And in fact, it's, it's pretty hard to actually really 
pin down a, a method. If you had to say, what's the Ajahn Chah method of meditation? Well, of course, at different times he taught different methods, but there's no kind of system as such. He would just teach as he saw fit for different individuals at different times. And so this is, this is really, for me, uh, the thing that's already, always been very, very uh, striking, very inspiring about the forest tradition is that sense of commitment and uh, faith that if we understand and apply the Dhamma, those, those central teachings of the Dhamma, those things that everybody acknowledges are the real message the Buddha taught, if we apply those things with 100% total dedication and sincerity, the results will be there. They will bear fruit. And this is quite radical and one of the um, almost unrecognized, I think, I think uh, um, revolutions in modern Buddhism, something which we uh, as Buddhists who have mainly learned about Buddhism from uh, an English-speaking background uh, are maybe not so aware of. But actually it's the case that most of the, um, say, the Theravadan traditions from, from, say, medieval times up until the 20th century, most of them believed that uh, it was no longer possible to get enlightened. Okay? This is basically the orthodox point of view. So the orthodox point of view is that the paths and fruits are closed uh, and there's no possibility of getting enlightened and often there's not even any purpose in doing meditation. Okay, so this is different from somebody who simply doesn't do meditation, right? <laughs> this is actually having the view that meditation is a waste of time, okay? And that, and it may be being a bit harsh, but that's pretty much the orthodox position of most of the Theravada world uh, coming up to the 20th century. And one of the things that many people did in different parts of the Buddhist world in modern times is that they've always tried to go back to what they understand to be the original teachings. And they do that in different kinds of ways. In every case though, um, certainly within the Theravada world, then that search is in some way uh, based on or derived on the teachings of the Pali Canon. Okay? So even in the forest tradition, uh, who is not a, not, a, not a study tradition, still indirectly the agendas and the ideas which they are uh, promoting actually is based on uh, a, 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 an ideology of going back to the original teachings in the Pali Canon. And interestingly enough, historically, that search to go back and seek the original teachings in the Pali Canon was uh, largely motivated by Western influence. That is to say, it was a response to colonialism, uh, an attempt to seek the value of one's own spiritual tradition f facing the threat from the West, uh, and also using the techniques which have been developed through, mainly in Protestantism in the text-critical world. And we shouldn't underestimate this. Most of what we see today as modern Buddhism, even in Asian countries, actually is a modern invention which was developed in response to the importation of Western ideas into Buddhist cultures. And so, uh, in the forest tradition, and we can see this, this movement, if you read the biography of Ajahn Man, and this of course is one of the great monuments of the forest tradition. We used to have some free copies here, I'm not sure if we still have them anymore. And uh, quite an amazing uh, biography, spiritual biography, or hagiography perhaps. Uh, and one of the things that it emphasizes is there that Ajahn Man had to, uh, practicing the early part of the 20th century, he had to answer for himself the question of whether Buddhist practice still worked. Okay? He was he kind of assumed that he was in an environment that where this was a serious, at least a serious question. 
if not a, a normally accepted view, that actually meditation and so on didn't really lead to enlightenment anymore. And he had to personally try to practice and overcome that. And that's what he did. And he did it really. Um, yes, he had support from uh, Sangha and friends in the Sangha and so on. He had a teachers for various parts of the way. But uh, they were not able to, to teach him the very advanced practices that he reached. Okay? At a certain point, he surpassed his teachers and uh, had to keep on going. And, of course, Ajahn Man is widely regarded as being an arahant in Thailand, the father of the modern forest tradition. So if we look at, well, what did he do? What did Ajahn Man do? Well, if you look at the photos of Ajahn Man, you see he scowled a lot. <laughs> I don't know if that's really the case that he scowled a lot, but... It was kind of um, the uh, the polite thing in Thailand that you didn't kind of you didn't um, show your teeth. It was kind of this kind of the respectful thing for monks that they should kind of you should be kind of be a bit serious in that when you're looking at the camera. This is old old times, and he looks like really emaciated. He looks like he's on the verge of death. He's so skinny, but actually, if you go to northeast Thailand, you realise it's not because of any necessarily any particular ascetic practices. It's because one, the food is so bad. And uh, two, because he smoked. And uh, so the monks who, the monks who uh, uh, stay in that area, especially the old monks who smoke a bit, then they tend to be very skinny like that. So, of course, it raises a big question. Can, you, can an arahant smoke? Of course, Ajahn Buddha Dasa, one of the other teachers, said, this is ridiculous, an arahant can't smoke. What do you reckon? Is it possible for a fully enlightened monk or nun or lay person to smoke? Nodding vigorously. Because that's just your attachments, yeah? All the smokers nodding vigorously. <laughs> if he doesn't inhale, yeah. <laughs> Maybe if he, if he just sticks to tobacco, it should be all right. There is an actual allowance in the veneer to smoke for health reasons. And uh, monks sometimes wonder about this because there wasn't any tobacco in ancient India. So we wonder what kind of herbs the monks were actually smoking in those days. So anyway, that's a subject for further investigation. Um, so what was Ajahn Man like? It's difficult to say what Ajahn Man was like because we have this biography, but his biography was written by Ajahn Mahabua, who's also regarded as an Araha. But Ajahn Mahabua is a, is a pretty extreme kind of character, yeah? He's a kickboxer. Now, in, in Buddhism, they have this uh, idea they call vasana. And uh, what that means is that uh, a vasana is like a trace or a residue or a tendency. And uh, so according to the usual way it's, it's formulated is that the buddha is uh, free of all vasanas. Okay, so he's, he's purified his mind to such a degree that he doesn't have any kind of personality quirks anymore. All right? Whether that's true or not, I don't know, but that's just how the theory goes. But, but the other arahants still have vasana. Okay? So they can still have their personality quirks. And the classic example of that was Sariputta, the Buddha's great disciple, foremost in wisdom. You can imagine this leader of the Sangha, very dignified monk, and this sort of expounder of the Dhamma, and the Buddha's right-hand man, and so on. And he used to skip across the puddles of water when he was going on arms round. And the other monks used to criticize him. How can he go skipping across the puddles of water? And the Buddha said, don't worry, he was born as a monkey in 50 past lives. <laughs> He can't help it. That's just his wasana, his character. So again, whether that story is true or not, I don't really know. But uh, you get the idea yeah, that uh, people can have character traits or quirks and or eccentricities, but that doesn't, that's got nothing to do with whether they're enlightened or not. So Ajahn Mahabua, anyway, to come back to that, he's, he's, he was probably a kickboxer in 50 past lives. I don't know. And uh, he's still very much got a very kind of fiery way of teaching the Dhamma. He's also got very strong metta uh, in many ways. Wouldn't want to exaggerate that. But anyway, he cert certainly the, the Ajahn Man we see through his biography is very definitely 
Ajahn Mahabhuas, Ajahn Man. Yeah? And, uh, for example, the impression we get of Ajahn Man from Ajahn Tate's biography, one of the other monks, Ajahn Tate, was a very different character. He was very smooth, very kind of refined, very gentle. And uh, the impression we get of Ajahn Man from him is somewhat different. So, anyway, what did Ajahn Man do? Well, he used to stay in remote places, the mountains. I met one of the monks who practiced with him once. And uh, he was saying that when they were practicing together in the mountains, there was about four of them, and they used to stay in the hills around Chiang Mai. And they used to stay one per hill. And every week on the Poya day, the, 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 uh, the, on the, the, the quarter moon day or half moon day, they would, they, would put the, they would hold up a lantern so that they could see that they were still alive. And then on the Oposa today, every fortnight, they would get together and chant the Padimoka, the monk's uh, code of discipline. And uh, that was how they would live. And they'd just have a very simple kuti, simple bamboo hut in the forest, and a uh, uh, pretty, very, very, uh, very simple life. And that was the foundation of what we call the forest tradition in Thailand. And I don't want to go into a whole history of the forest tradition, which has changed and developed a lot since that, those days. And uh, it, yes, you will still find uh, monasteries that are like that, that are very secluded, very simple, uh, and with the monks in there practicing uh, very diligently. But also you'll find within the forest tradition, of course, a lot of wealth has come, a lot of fame has come, and all of the dhammas that are associated with those things tend to creep in as well. But it's not my, my purpose to talk about the forest tradition, but to talk about, for me, what I find inspiring about it is just that, that, that very, that pure idea to say, we know what, we know what the work is. And we're going to stick with that and pursue that and follow that to the depths of what we're capable of. And we're not going to let anything stop us. And this is always the thing that I personally find most inspiring about the forest tradition. And uh, Ajahn Man was obviously a very incredibly powerful and, and charismatic uh, monk and teacher and gathered around him a, a group of, of disciples. And it was quite extraordinary because even though the disciples he had around him they weren't great in number, but nevertheless, there were many great enlightened disciples that came from that. And so you have what started out as being an individual quest for enlightenment, for freedom from suffering. And it ended up as a movement which has actually changed the face of Thai Buddhism and then less directly that of world Buddhism. And uh, indirectly, of course, we're all here because of that. So this is... Uh, part of uh, modern Buddhism, a similar or related kind of movement was happening at the same time in Burma. And uh, similarly in Burma, um, there was a movement to try to put authentic Buddhist practice uh, back in the center of the agenda. And also based on the idea that we can actually realize enlightenment. Of course, the most famous exponent and promoter of this was Mahasi Sayadaw. Uh, but he was only one of many, uh, many monks who promoted that kind of idea. And so you had the development of or invention of what we call a meditation method. Okay? So we shouldn't be uh, like a meditation system or meditation method uh, in the modern sense, was invented in the mid-20th century in Burma. And uh, in a sense, it's a corporatization of Buddhism, okay? So, and the idea of a meditation retreat, okay? So this is like the kind of the McDonald's of Buddhism, meditation retreat, right? You, you, you package up something which is infinitely repeatable, and, of course, the ultimate example of that is the Goenka retreat, where you don't even have to have teachers anymore. You just play a tape. Yeah? 
And so it's infinitely repeatable. You can press them out as many as you like. And that idea was invented in Burma in the mid-20th century. And again, the motivation behind that was to try to bring uh, a very authentic and very direct approach to Buddhist practice to as many people's lives as possible. Okay? That was the, the driving force behind that. And the main difference was that the Burmese approach uh, tended to emphasize more on the system of meditation, and that system was uh, developed as part of an Abhidhamma framework. That means the Abhidhamma is like the scholastic philosophy of Buddhism. It was a series of books originally written two to four hundred years after the Buddha and elaborated greatly in later times. And so the Burmese meditation systems are all based on Abhidhamma uh, philosophy. And even those, those differences from the Thai approach notwithstanding, nevertheless there is that similarity of um, purpose. And if you've ever done any of those Burmese meditation methods, you will know that one of the things that they do very, very well is they just cut out all the rubbish. Okay? And they just cut out the, uh, all the paraphernalia of Buddhism and they just point you straight to this. Yeah? <laughs> In a way that's actually quite frightening and can be quite uncompromising. Yeah? You're just sitting there barely, that's it, you're just naked in front of your own mind. And you're thinking, God, I haven't seen that before. I don't know if I want to see it anymore. And so it's quite hard to take. Yeah? It's, 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 these, these approaches are quite, um, quite something. Yeah? Quite uh, uh, take a lot of um, application on the part of the meditator. And so when we're doing those kinds of practices, we get uh, very good at... Um, <clears throat> Just looking, you know, at, at things like, um, what does feeling feel like? Yeah? We have feelings and sensations inside our body. What does it actually feel like? And normally we just spend our life running away from them. Okay? We get a tension in our body, we move it. We get an itch, we scratch it. And so we're constantly running away from feeling. And so what these meditations are very good at is just saying, I'm not going to run away from it. They're... I'm just going to be with it. Feeling is okay. What's wrong with feeling? Good feelings, bad feelings. And if we're really successful in that, uh, it can be very, very powerful. I read a story a number of years ago about a, um, a, an elder lady who was a long-term practitioner of Goenka Method. And... Uh, <clears throat> She was uh, diagnosed with um, cancer, and it was a, I can't remember what, what it was now, but it was a particularly painful kind of cancer, and, and the doctors were amazed. They said to her, how, how, could you, how, you know, how come you haven't been complaining about this? How, hasn't it been causing pain? And uh, she said, oh yes, it's been causing pain. It's, it's a lot worse than the pains of childbirth. But our teachers told us to watch painful feeling with equanimity, so that's what I've been doing. <laughs> so there's obviously somebody who's able to take that practice and really uh, apply it. And then sometime later she was dying of that same cancer and she was lying on it, dying on her deathbed. Uh, and then in the final moments she actually struggled up to sit meditation and sitting meditation she... Uh, passed away. So that's like a hero, isn't it? Yeah, isn't that amazing that people can still do that? It's like it's something you read about in the kind of the ancient books. You know, there's there's some kind of monk sitting meditation in until they die in a cave or something like that. But it can happen. That was just an ordinary housewife. That wasn't anyone, you know. That wasn't a monk in a cave or anything like that. It was an ordinary housewife with lots of kids and. We'd been through everything in life, but she had that real dedication. And so that's one of the things which this 
process of going back to the roots of Buddhism can do, it actually releases a huge amount of energy. Yeah? It's like you're contacting with the source, and when the, when the mind contacts with that source, it actually explodes with this energy. And we think about it, we look at that, we reflect that, you know, say the Thai forest tradition, there are now thousands of, of, of monks in that tradition, hundreds and hundreds of monasteries, and the teachings have spread all around the world, and that whole kind of energy of that has just exploded out of that one desire to actually just know and practice and realize the real Dhamma. And similarly with the Burmese tradition, the same thing, same phenomenon, that, that wish to go back and really feel and experience the essence of the Dhamma, to really experience the same thing that the Buddha experienced, and the act of contacting that releases this tremendous energy, which is felt, it's not, just, it's not a theoretical energy, but it's an actual energy which thousands and thousands of people have felt within themselves. And if any of you have been on uh, a meditation retreat or something like that, you will have felt that energy to one degree or another. And that, that, that wish, that strength in yourself that says, I'm going to uh, endure this, I'm going to keep progressing, and I'm going to find peace. And this is where that energy comes from that act of going back and contacting the true Dhamma. And so this is very, very important to notice this. None of that energy comes from um, uh, uh, kind of necessarily like maintaining the forms of the Dhamma. Okay? The forms are just forms. They're not particularly inspiring. They might be nice enough. Okay? We might put a Buddha Rupa on our shrine and think that's nice. But in the end, that's just a form, and it doesn't mean anything very much by itself. And it's very, very important. We need to keep on working at this point to, act, to keep on discarding the empty forms and to seek for the actual truth that underlies them. We have to keep on doing this, and we can't let last generation's answers be good enough for ourselves. We have to throw away the last generation's answers as well. We're not Ajahn Man. We're not in the situation that he was in. We're not in the culture and the times that he was in. We're not facing the problems that he was facing. We can ask the same questions that he asked, but the answers, to some degree, will be different. Okay? In terms of the, the basics of the Dhamma, abandoning greed, hatred and delusion within our hearts, that answer will be the same. But in terms of actually how you manifest that in the culture, the society, with the people around you, then that will be different. And those answers which he came to are not necessarily the answers which we're going to come to. The answers which Ajahn Chah came to are not going to be the answers which I'm going to come to. That's not because I think I'm better than Ajahn Chah, it's just because I'm in a different situation. And so always there's this tendency to grab hold of and to insist upon the externals of the form. So like in the forest tradition, it's amazing, you know. If you read books by, you know, biography of Ajahn Man or Ajahn Mahabhu, he's talking about these incredible states of meditation and he goes into these amazing transformed consciousnesses and he talks about this, this incredible transcendental awareness of, 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 of total consciousness. And then he says, Ajahn Mahabhu is very funny, and then he says, ah, that, that, that bright, radiant mind, that's ignorance, that's delusion, yeah? and you have to destroy that and smash that. Yeah? <laughs> and he goes so far into, into the Dhamma. And yet, if you, if you go and you hang around with the, the forest monks for long enough, you find that they argue about things like, 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 see on the robes here, right? Now I've got these, on the outside of the robes you have a border that's sewn onto the robe. Now, this particular robe is, I'm afraid, is the wrong tradition. And in the Dhammayut tradition, it's sewn on the outside of the robe. And on the Mahanikai tradition, which is my tradition, supposedly, it's on the inside. And I've got my, ins I've got my insides on the outside, unfortunately, so I'm a bad monk, right? 
and those kinds of things. And the other one, which is really even more important, that's actually, that's actually a fine point because you can argue that if you sow the border on the inside that it tends to wear less and it helps to protect the robe more. So that's, there's actually a, a rational basis on that particular argument. The other one is that the, you know, the, the robes are sown according to the rice paddy pattern of the fields of Magadha. Okay? So that means if you've ever seen the rice paddies, that they've got the kind of the low areas where the, where the rice is grown, and then they have like the, the dikes which go along. So when they flood the fields, they can walk around the, the, the paddies. And so they form like a checked pattern. And originally, the cloth that the Buddha, the robes the Buddha recommended to Venerable Ananda were to be in the, the, the pattern of the rice paddy fields of the Magadhan area, which you can still see today if you go to Magadha. Now, the problem is, is this before the harvest or after the harvest? <laughs> right? If it's before the harvest, when the rice is at its height, then the rice is higher than the dikes. Yeah? Yeah? And if it's after the harvest, then the dikes are higher than the field. Yeah? And so this is the question. So again, I can't even, I'm such a bad monk. I can't even remember which one's which now. But I know that in one of the traditions you're supposed to have it's supposed to be before the harvest and in the other tradition it's supposed to be after the harvest and that changes the way that you sow it. So this is, this is, this is the kind of thing that, that uh, we can sometimes spend our time worrying about, right? And uh, I don't know how serious, but so different people take these things with different levels of seriousness. As you can perhaps tell, there's a sort of slight degree of cynicism in my... <laughs> presentation in this, and I find it a little bit difficult to take these things seriously. And uh, I was very re refreshed when I went to stay with Ajahn Brahm in Bodhinyana and then the, some of the monks came to visit from Sri Lanka. And they had Sri Lankan coloured robes on and Sri Lankan style bowls. And some of the monks said, oh, should they swap over and wear the same kind of robes that we wear? And Ajahn Brahm said, as long as the robe is good enough to cover the body and the, ro the bowl is sufficient to eat out of, then that's all that matters. Yeah? And uh, so I thought uh, that was a very refreshing attitude. And uh, so this is why we have to keep on deconstructing. Okay? And so we have to keep on making this kind of revolution. We have to keep on t testing and questioning because things are just going to get stuck in a certain way. You know, and, and it's one of the things that I learnt when I was in Thailand is that um, you, know, you might hear, oh, Thai monks do it this way, or this is the Thai tradition, or this is the forest tradition. But actually, if you go around to all the monasteries, every monastery does it differently. So there is no actual Thai tradition. There is no actual forest tradition. What there is, is human beings who are practicing within an environment, and they make choices, and they make, have behaviors. And those choices, those behaviors will be different in different contexts, just like it is everywhere else in the world. There's no kind of monolithic, unified tradition, very far from it. So this takes, when we, when we really start to take this seriously, it takes some courage, because we ultimately have to rely on our own judgment. And we have to be the one who says, no, actually this is not Dhamma. This is Dhamma, and that's not Dhamma. Yeah? And that's quite a weighty responsibility. Yeah? None of us can escape it. Right? None of you can, can sit there and say it's dumber because Bhante Sajato said it's dumber. Right? <laughs> that's rubbish. All right? It's not dumber because I said it's dumber. You have to f know for yourself. You have to listen very carefully to what I'm saying. Does it make sense? Is it in, in accord with the Buddha's teachings? Does it actually lead to liberation? Does it lead to freedom? And we have to keep on asking these questions. It's not just enough to do it once. It's not just enough to take it for granted. It needs to be a continual process, continually uprooting and like weeding out those things that are unnecessary. And so this is, this is one of the verses in the Dhammapada, you know, to see the, who oh, sees the essential as the inessential and someone who sees the inessential as essential, yeah? This is a, this is a mistaken kind of understanding. So we shouldn't uh, think that just because something is Buddhism 
that it's necessarily right or good or true or that it's Dhamma. And nor, of course, should we think that because something is not Buddhism that it's wrong or false or that it's not Dhamma. Okay? It's not the Buddha never said that. The Buddha never said that there's only Dhamma to be found in my religion and there's no Dhamma to be found outside of that. On the contrary, he was constantly uh, dialoguing with people of other faiths and was very happy to accept uh, what they said if it was true and if it was good. And on the, he was also happy to reject it if it wasn't true and wasn't good. So when we're, when we're, when we're uh, uh, undertaking this process, there's, uh, I guess, two, two um, aspects or two stages of that. One stage is, is more like a preliminary or theoretical stage, and that's when you're doing what you're doing right now, which is just to, to listen, to reflect, to think about it, discuss it, read, and so on, and get a conceptual understanding of what seems reasonable. And keeping on working at that, but also being a bit humble with it, because we know that, well, we can never reach the real answer by that. Then taking those things and applying them in our practice, applying them in our own mind. And then seeing that's the real test. Okay? So the ultimate test, the ultimate litmus test in everything in Buddhism is how does it actually work in experience? If it's not actually working in experience, then it's rubbish. Throw it out. It doesn't matter if the Buddha taught it. The Buddha taught many things to many people at many different times. And just because the Buddha taught it, that's no reason why it should be relevant to you and I here and now. Okay? There are many things that he taught that are not relevant to you and I here and now. Okay? But we need to test that out and find out, is it relevant? Why did the Buddha teach this in this context? What actually happens if I really try to apply that? What happens if I really decide to take the Dhamma seriously and to think, maybe the Buddha was right, maybe what Ajahn Man and the other great masters have done is right, maybe the paths and the fruits of Buddhism are still alive, maybe the practice of Buddhism can actually bear fruit. Maybe if I practice sila samadhi panya, ethics, uh, concentration and wisdom, that I too can get enlightened. Maybe I can awaken to the Four Noble Truths. Maybe I can see dependent origination. Maybe I can see the nature of cessation, nibbana. Maybe I can know what it means for the mind to be purified. Maybe I can reach the ending of suffering. And if we can keep on reminding ourselves of those things, then that will uh, continue to fuel and inspire our spiritual practice. When we did the um, uh, ordination of the, the two nuns, the two summonaries, or sorry, the ordination of the one summonary, uh, a few weeks ago at the monastery and we had discussions about uh, bhikkhuni ordination and so on. We were reading the ordination procedure from different um, uh, traditions <clears throat> and I noticed that in one of them, in the uh, Dharmaguptaka vinaya as used in the Chinese tradition, it had a little phrase in there that is not found in the Pali, a little extra phrase and that was a piece of advice for the newly ordained nun is that she should not forget uh, the inspiration that caused her to originally want to go forth. Yeah? Don't forget that inspiration that made you want to practice in the first place. And even though that advice was given in the context of a nun, but it applies to, it, to all of us. And it was a very, very important uh, piece of advice. Don't forget it. Don't forget what made you interested in the Dhamma in the first place. Don't forget that feeling that feeling of recognition that there's something real, something true, something essential about the Buddha's teachings. And don't forget the energy and the inspiration and the joy that leaps up when we contact that. 
So this is my little talk for you this evening on Buddhism and uh, the importance of telling the, uh, differentiating the essential from the inessential. And I offer this to you for your reflection.